Uh, good morning and welcome to this uh, third oral evidence session of the uh, Just Energy Transition Inquiry of the All-Party Parliamentary Group uh, on uh, Africa. Um, we're particularly grateful to the Royal African Society um, and to Oxfam for their support uh, in this inquiry. Um, uh, I am um, uh, just introducing this and I'm then going to hand over to our two chairs for the panel sessions first. Uh, the chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Africa, Chion Wara, uh, and then um, Theo Clark, uh, MP. Um, uh, but first of all, um, I'm welcoming uh, Jackson Shah, who is a Maasai community activist, who is going to uh, give some testimony to the committee uh, before we uh, move into those panel sessions. Uh, Jackson, uh, over to you. Thank you. And... Uh... Honorable members, uh, present, uh, I'm Jackson Shah from Masai community in Kenya. And uh, I wish to take this opportunity to share my experience from my community uh, on issues of energy. And I'm so glad that I got this opportunity actually to give my brief on this matter. Uh, in fact, I come from an area which is rich in geothermal resource, which is one of the Kenya's greatest source of energy. Uh, a resource which had uh, exploitation since 1970. This is when Kenya started using it. And uh, it just came with a lot of advantages, a lot of good things, but at the same time, we had a lot of challenges, particularly in terms of community. Therefore, uh, being here today is to share our experiences, which can be, give inputs to the inquiry on just energy, because it is very much important we build our systems of energy production in our countries, in our areas, from a, a just point where social protection is actually taken care of. Therefore, my presentation is thinking about sustainable energy, navigating indigenous partnership in Kenya in terms of balancing development and social protection, because it will be very much important. And I wish to begin by sharing a, a map of where I come from. This is a map of our career. There are a number of projects which has been done already. Uh, five of them are active. That's for career one, for career five. And all of them have been actually producing a very high power source. For example, at around currently, it's almost 1000 megawatts. And therefore, it's it is producing a lot of energy to our country. And Kenya is depending more on this kind of research and targeting more because the area has a potential of 5,000 megawatts beside other areas like Silale, Menengai, Eburu, and many others. Therefore, uh, this resource exploitation has a long history that I mentioned in the 70s is when Kenya discovered the resource. And then 1980s, they, they started exploiting it. Uh, 
1981, we had the first power station with 45 megawatts. And this resource now became the beginning of the challenge among the Maasai people. Because immediately after 1984, we had the first eviction and in the name of conservation, not for energy per se, but there was they used a scheme of hiding the resource or spreading of the resource in terms of conservation. And this is when the health generation of power was created and the community were evicted. Around 1,500 uh, community members were evicted by then and we lost a big chunk of land and also total disturbance. And then they did not end there. The struggle continued. From 1984, we had a 2013, which we had a terrible uh, atom fiction where we lost 247 homes completely burned down. The community lived uh, the distress so much. And then 2018, we had another one which led by a, a project, Akira One, uh, which left 150 families from the Tukana community, which was living within that particular uh, area. Therefore, the community end up losing land, livelihood, and culture. Uh, something should have been actually supported by the new development of the other modality. Therefore, I my proposal is that indigenous communities facing displacement and cultural challenges, we should be taken care of as policies are being formulated. Then, looking at the settlement. In 2009, 2014, we have a bigger project, Four, which led to displacement or the location of 150 homes, but the way it was done was poorly done. And that left the community more poorer, more impoverished, and therefore they end up suffering a lot. Then, this is what I'm thinking about or proposing to this inquiry, that we need to look on a systems where we can have inclusive green energy initiatives, equitable access and good communication, where the community are actively participating through the project area, uh, project life cycle, uh, during the construction and also the, after construction. Issues of cultural informed communication plans should also be emphasized. Therefore, ensure access and effective communication throughout the process. Then flexibility and autonomy. We have systems of governance within our cultures. We should be protected, we should be respected. Therefore, we propose that this inquiry should provide policies that can help the community to realize themselves and also their rights to their culture and their culture should be protected. Then we have a, can, a number of projects, for example, Kipeto Wind Power, which was one of the best projects practiced in, in Kenya. And this project, it has actually a good benefit sharing and a, a communication channels with the community. Therefore, due to this, we find the community are well involved. Uh, then we can also have from outside Kenya, which can also provide some kind of uh, good models. Valuable insight from this, utilizing indigenous knowledge systems and also encouraging alternative livelihood as a way of building communities which are affected by the project. Their voices should be well taken care of. Therefore, I propose that education opportunities should be driven uh, empowering indigenous voices and also giving the community a right to to be well informed. Therefore, that's what I wish to say, but I'll share my written submission for more clarification on these matters. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jackson, for um, providing us with such a um, clear um, exposition there. Um, we're very grateful to you. And um, yes, it would be very helpful if you can share your, your notes as well with the inquiry. Um, I'm now going to hand over to um, 
uh, our chair of the APPG, Chi Onwara MP, uh, to chair the next panel. Chi, over to you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Lord Oaks, and thanks very much to uh, Jackson for um, for sharing those um, very clear and uh, and, and thought provoking. Uh, contribution and um, as with all the as, it, as with all the speakers, the uh, Jackson's biography is in the chat, and um, the contribution to this uh, discussion is very much appreciated. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm the, I chair the All Party Parliamentary Group uh, for Africa uh, with Lord o with Lord Oates. I'm very um, I'm pleased to be able to chair this panel um uh, just on i i was at um cop cop 28 in um dubai uh late last year and the challenge if you like of equitable um access to the benefits of a transition and to uh, removing the um removing the um inequitable indeed uh, um damaging um, co um um consequences um of previous um previous uh, examples so i think uh, it was very was, was came up consistently so i think those examples of best practice are really powerful so the first panel this morning is going to explore a uh, value chain regulation to protect um if we're talking about social envi and environmental rights um within the context of energy transition and it's also going to um revisit the re regulation of carbon markets, which was covered in part at the previous session on finance. Domestically in the UK, there have been numerous calls for better value chain accountability over the years. And, uh, and the Business Human Rights and Environment Act, um, a due diligence law modelled on the UK Bribery Act, has already been recommended by Parliament's Joint Committee on Human Rights. Um, and a similar style private member bill bought by Baroness uh, Lola Young is currently awaiting a second reading in the House of Lords. And further, there's an increasing concern and evidence that carbon markets are compounding human rights uh, violations experienced by indigenous people who are being displaced in the name of conservation and something that uh, it also came up uh, at uh, in cop 28 and, and i've recently written to andrew mitchell who is our um the, the foreign office's africa minister about so um let's um let's welcome our first panel today uh, as i said buyers are in the chat but we have uh, and uh, uh, my apologies for any uh, incorrect, incorrect pronunciation of names. Um, Glenn Mpufanya, Joseph Kibugi, Mugwa Manga, and Ye Catherine uh, Ding. Now, I'm going to uh, ask uh, a question, um, firstly, of, uh, of Glenn. Um, and um, Glenn will respond um, in about seven minutes, and then of, of, of Joseph, and then the other members of the panel will ask questions. So my first question um, to Glenn Mpufeni, who is the Occupational Health Lead at uh, Industrial Global Union, um, what national and international regulation is needed of private investment to protect the rights of communities and workers and enable them to share in the benefits of clean energy, e.g. E through improved energy access and associated uh, co-benefits? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable MP uh, Chi Onura and to the Just Transition Inquiry Committee for the invitation and the opportunity to give oral evidence to the inquiry. Uh, actually, the question goes to the heart of workers and community concerns who face the brand of unmitigated negative energy transition impacts. And to the extent that energy transition is just depends in part to the answer to your question. Uh, private investment left to its own devices will not bring about a just energy transition, hence the need for national and international regulation. However, it is important to note the different conceptions of what a just transition means. National and international regulation must confront these different meanings to arrive at appropriate policy options on what is needed. So the spectrum of definition ranges from those that claim the moral righteousness and program efficacy of various distribution of costs and benefits, while some 
place differing emphasis on the claims and needs of workers, communities, and the environment. While trade union definitions ensure, ensures workers' rights while demanding social dialogue and national ownership of assets, some NGO foreground their organization's expertise at the expense of workers' priorities. On the other hand, uh, institutional uh, 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 Institutional, international institutions offer definitions that are market-based and non-transformative, while industry definitions often posit a slower transition. So this is the range that we must navigate. The International Labour Organization, the ILO, provides a, pro, a comprehensive and widely used definition that captures a holistic approach. It says this about just transition, that it is a bridge from where we are today to a future where all jobs are green and decent, poverty is eradicated, and communities are thriving and resilient. More precisely, it is systemic and whole of economy approach to sustainability. It includes both measures to, reach the, to reduce the impact of job losses and industry phase out as in coal on workers and communities and measures to produce new green and decent jobs, sectors and healthy communities. Uh, having said that, uh, and, and speaking to the range of options, you know, in terms of the definition, uh, climate change must not be at the expense of energy justice, social justice and economic justice. That is why just transition is so critical for effective climate action. The Paris Agreement had this to say about this, emphasizing the importance of respecting and taking into account human rights, gender equality, the rights of indigenous peoples as we've just had, intergenerational concerns when taking action to, try to address climate change and a just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs in accordance with nationally defined development priorities and strategies. Some statistics quickly. According to the IA World Energy Outlook flagship report, Africa's clean energy investment fell to its lowest level since 2011. It says of the $434 billion invested globally to build wind, solar, and other clean power projects, only 0.6% or 2.6 billion went to Africa. The report goes on to say that while Africa has abundant solar energy potential, it is home to just 1.3% of global solar capacity. Another report by IRENA, Renewable Energy Market Analysis, Africa and its regions 2022, it says only 2% of global investments in renewable energy in the last two two decades were made in Africa with significant regional disparities leading to, to the observation that a large part of Africa has so far been left out of the energy transition. And that is the biggest challenge, you know, uh, you know for, the, for the inquiry in the committee. All is not lost though. According to climate scope policy score versus the five-year clean energy asset finance in emerging markets 2022, National policies setting long-term goals for renewable energy de deployment have been widely adopted in Africa. Clean energy, energy targets are on the books in 86% of African countries. While that is less than the 97% in Asia Pacific, 95% in the Americas and 97% in Europe, it still represents important progress. That progress notwithstanding overall capital for the clean energy transition is not flowing to Africa. In conclusion, it comes down to where is the money and the politics around that in terms of just energy uh, you know, transition finance and the role of national and international regulation in terms of what is needed of private investment to protect the rights of communities and workers and enable them to share in the benefits of clean energy through improved energy access and associated core benefits. So that would be my uh, submission uh, in the uh, uh, Honorable MP. Thank you very much. Um, thank, um, thank you very much uh, for that um, enlightening um, exposition on uh, some of the, the, the regulatory uh, needs and, uh, and the ability to share the 
benefits of clean energy. Um, I'm now going to turn to Joseph uh, Kabugu, um, and I'm going to ask uh, um, Joseph uh, what regulations are needed to ensure, to, moving on actually, from, from, or, or building on that, what regulations are needed to ensure that investors and companies adhere to human rights and environmental sustainability in their operations and supply chains? And what are the strengths and weaknesses of the EU due diligence law currently being debated by the European Council? And what are the implications for the called for UK Business Human Rights and Environment Act? Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Thank you very much, um, Honourable Member of Parliament, and uh, thank you for having me. As I said, my name is Joseph Kibu, and I serve as the Africa Regional Manager at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Uh, we are an international organization, a human rights organization that promotes respect for human rights by businesses, uh, first by empowering advocates, amplifying uh, the voices of the vulnerable, and also human rights advocates in uh, civil society organizations, media, government, and within companies. And then secondly, we strengthen corporate accountability by helping communities to get companies to respond to their concerns and giving companies an opportunity to respond to these allegations. And finally, we build corporate transparency by tracking the human rights performance uh, policies and practices of over uh, 10,000 uh, companies. And this gives us a vantage point as an organization to uh, contribute to this discussion, especially on um, uh, just energy uh, transition, which is one of our core thematic areas. <clears throat> now, my uh, the previous speakers have uh, said this, and I will not belabor the point, that voluntariness has failed to protect uh, individuals and workers affected by uh, business operations, including in the uh, energy uh, value chain. We continue to uh, observe patterns um, that are a bit troubling, um, especially here in Africa, where we have uh, both uh, uh, upstream and downstream engagement um, with this conversation on renewable energy, upstream because of uh, the presence of minerals and downstream because uh, the energy gap, um, less than 50% of our continent having reliable uh, energy, then calls for green energy as one of the most viable substitutes. On the renewable energy front, we've um, we've got a tool that we call the uh, Renewable Energy Bank Benchmark, and we've been tracking the performance of uh, uh, companies involved in the manufacture of installations and where the renewable energy installations are in are in in Africa and beyond. And we see worrying patterns. One is uh, uh, very few companies that have policies that uh, look at the rights. Uh, of human rights defenders, human rights and environmental defenders, uh, both at the company level, but also at, uh, at a macro level. The second one is policies around uh, indigenous people's rights and land rights. And this is worrying again, because most of the deployments are in areas inhabited by indigenous persons and also groups that are marginalized uh, across the continent. And then, we see a lack of engagement by developers on uh, identifying uh, potential benefit uh, sh uh, sharing uh, agreements, uh, but we are beginning to see some uh, good cases as um, uh, Jackson has, has mentioned. And then finally, we see um, a lack of information, a lack of information by indigenous uh, communities, and again, those who are affected by uh, these installations. On the extractive uh, side, uh, we have uh, received uh, grievances around right rights, environmental pollution, threats to human rights defenders, and also effective lack of effective grievance uh, mechanisms, not to mention workers' rights and a lack of you know, decent wages for workers. What are communities yearning for? There is the, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center has uh, collaborated with other actors in the sector, including businesses and come up with what we call the just energy transition of principles. And there are three uh, core principles. The first one is shared prosperity, that we have got to think about a business model that drives fast transition, but it will one that will build trust and stability and reduce these systemic risks that I've talked about through shared prosperities that build worker and community rights in companies' operations and supply chain. 
The second one is the need for human rights and social protection. This is where governments and companies have a duty to, uh, of care to shield workers and communities from harm, to demonstrate due diligence and to minimize human rights and environmental risks, and also to ensure pro pro uh, uh, social protection, uh, retaining and creating new decent work for those communities that are transitioning. And then finally, it's to think about fair negotiations. I talked about um, the right to information. How can we make sure that communities and workers needs guarantee that their negotiations upfront and um, as these uh, projects go on will be fair throughout the operational life cycles and when assessing the mediation to have. This means uh, inclusive community consultation and the robust implementation of uh, the principles of free prior and informed consent for indigenous communities and also guarantees that workers, indigenous communities and community leaders will not be silenced through intimidation. And this brings me to the conclusion. Why are these policies important? They are important because we need to uh, promote social accountability. We need to a policy and laws that can lead to a selection of products and services that are eco-friendly. We need to incentivize the evaluation of the total cost of ownership over the product life cycle, uh, questions about uh, waste disposal, and not just prioritizing the lowest price. We also need to think about proper procurement uh, policies, what they can play, uh, the role that they can play in a more sustainable future. This will support the, uh, the, the, the realization of the three principles that we have spoken about. What will that do? We would like uh, to think of, or communities are saying, we have not been involved. The human rights due diligence is uh, seen to be lacking. So a framework that can mandate corporate human rights due and environmental due diligence, and including uh, that includes obligations for bidders and contractors in public procurement processes that is based on transparency, that is based on uh, effective risk assessment and mitigation plans through stakeholder engagement. That is what uh, this legislation, uh, any legislation, including um, uh, the CSDPD, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, could do to put human rights at the center of this transition to make sure that it is not just fair, but it is also fast. I thank you and um, back to you, uh, uh, Honorable Member of Parliament. Uh, thanks very much. I think it's over to me. Is that okay, Chi? Um, uh, and my question is to Mugwe Manga. Good morning, Mugwe. It's good to, good to see you again. Um, my Thank question you. is um, on carbon markets. Um, should and can they be mobilised to increase available funding while supporting community rights and conservation efforts? What are the justice distributional implications and risks uh, and what can be done by the UK government to mitigate those risks? Uh, over to you, Bugwe. Thank you, Chair. Honourable members, it's a pleasure to be here with you. My name is Mugwe Manga. I am a breakthrough climate champion, a renewable energy and carbon asset developer. I have spent the last 15 years of my career developing renewable energy projects and also advising governments and non-governmental organisations. Of late, I am a technical advisor as well to the Rockefeller Foundation, where we have established the Africa Carbon Market Initiative, which is an ambitious initiative that is seen to catalyze carbon markets in Africa. We see a tremendous opportunity in carbon markets. We foresee that it can be able to generate over $120 billion of revenue for African governments and generate over 30 million green jobs by the year 2040 if the right measures are taken and the right opportunities are put in place. Carbon markets offer a tremendous opportunity when it comes to climate finance. We don't see it as the panacea or the solution, but we see it as being part of a solution to many different varieties of finance. The idea around carbon markets is to see how can we incentivize the global south, including Africa, 
which hosts tremendous amounts of carbon assets, to try and convert those into assets that can generate these credits and also can do good by generating climate positive carbon negative uh, projects that can enable communities to be better off, that can enable the global north to offset their carbon emissions as well. In the medium term, it will also allow us to tap into climate finance that is badly needed at a rate that is very attractive. Now, the first part of the work we see that is very important is in establishing the right policies on the continent. As you know, there are very few countries in Africa that do have a climate change act. Kenya is one of the few that implemented this in the last administration. And we've seen recent amendments to the act to incorporate the carbon trading um, elements that are speak that typically speak to Article 6 of the UNFCCC. Following on from Glasgow, uh, at the COP of Glasgow, we saw that governments needed to implement Article 6 in order to allow for the compliance markets to, to thrive and for trades to happen. And so having these policies is, is critical. Part of the work I have been involved in has seen the development of what we're calling carbon market activation plans. These plans are there to give a roadmap to governments on how to implement these policies effectively, how to also tailor make them to speak to the nature of their countries and ensure that the benefits are, are trickling down to the communities and all stakeholders. We speak of stakeholder capitalism and shared prosperity. This is something that comes to the heart of carbon markets because predominantly the majority of the carbon credits that have been issued on the continent have been nature-based, which are tied towards community land and land is at the heart of the matter in this. It's safe to say also that it's not just nature-based solutions that are on the table. There are other solutions such as e-cooking, which is solving a major problem in Africa. And we're seeing that 90%, uh, almost 80% of Africans don't have access to clean cooking. And this is a challenge that needs to be solved quickly if we're to fight deforestation as well, and also health matters when it comes to inhaling um, toxins from cooking through um, um, fossil-based uh, sources. Um, safe to say that despite the fact that we see different opportunities and, and different streams of developing carbon credits, nature based remains very dominant. And because of this, governments are moving towards securing the rights of, of, of individual communities through policy, and also trying to define the right of a carbon credit. Uh, it sounds very nuanced, but the rights of the carbon credit and who actually owns the carbon credit is something that many countries are grappling with because you cannot see it, you cannot smell it, you cannot touch it. But at the same time, it does have a value and it is an asset class. But who owns the right is one tug of war that is being played out right now and the discussions are ongoing because governments feel that it is their right, but private sector players generating this feel that it is their asset and most constitutions enshrine the right of tenure and the right to an asset. And so a lot of discussions, a lot of stakeholder engagement is needed. And this is going to enable us to develop robust um, policies, robust frameworks that will see the co-benefits and encourage and incentivize investment into these areas because the continent is desperately needs to see these investments go through and generate the necessary employment. In terms of the risks, what we see is the risk of a lot of misunderstanding, the risk of a lot of information not getting to the right places, the risk of not doing enough stakeholder engagement and capacity building, because we need to be working on an equal footing as all stakeholders, communities, governments, private sector, public sector. And ensuring that there is enough participation and enough com com um, capacity building will enable that and will enable agency, which would be beneficial to seeing projects move on positively. I think what the parli parliament and the UK can do to enhance this is first and foremost uh, enacting 
bilateral agreements with countries that would speak towards how carbon credits should be traded also with institutions from the United Kingdom. Um, it could touch on the areas that are of interest. It could touch on pricing. It can even touch on where, they, where the UK feels and how distribution of, of uh, carbon benefits and revenues should be, should be allocated. And I think having this in place and having these clear frameworks can ensure governments and private sector work hand in hand with a clear framework. And it would also incentivize uh, private sector to come in. One of the things we've seen in our research is off takers and investors are very keen on having frameworks and regulatory frameworks set in place in a well-managed and structured way. So this is one way of doing this. Um, so that's what I would say for now. And <laughs> we'll be open to more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, my boy. Thank you very much. Thank you. I need to uh, uh, move move on now to ask a, a question to Oyei Catherine Dieng. Um, and I understand that she's having difficult different difficulties with her connection. So she, um, I think she may be keeping her her video off. Uh, but my question to her is: How is the uh, Just Energy Transmission Partnership, the JetP, so far being received in Senegal? What are the key challenges and could the approach be improved? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me in this uh, in this panel. So my name is Yai Catherine Job Jiang. I am the head of energy transition unit um, at the Ministry of Energy here in Senegal. Uh, so to to answer the question, um, so in Senegal, uh, I I should say that uh, firstly, uh, the government started the energy transition uh, process since two thousand and twelve. Uh, the actual government uh, decided to develop uh, many uh, renewable projects. We have solar projects and wind projects which are uh, today about 30% of our energy mix here in, in, in Senegal. So uh, in the last year, we, we concluded um, a JETP with the, 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 G, the, the G7 uh, countries, which are France, uh, Germany, um the, the the united kingdom the european union um and uh, the, the last the last country is canada uh, we concluded a jetp with, which is a just energy transition partnership uh, and this uh, this partnership is about um the 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 the, the the partners will uh, will um, will give to Senegal 2.5 uh, billion euros, and Senegal will will increase the part of uh, renewable energy in our mix, which is uh, today at 30 uh, at about 31 percent to 40 uh, percent within 2030. So this is globally uh, the jet P that we concluded in in, in Senegal. So this partnership, uh, as I said, we concluded it uh, the last year. Uh, it went through uh, about uh, maybe seven or eight months of negotiation with, with the partners. And it was concluded in June 2023. So if I if I may talk talk about how the the, the partnership uh, has been received here in in in, in Senegal, uh, this this partnership is uh, here to 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 confirm the the strategy of Senegal uh, on renewable energies. Uh, Senegal has a policy uh, to implement renewable energy projects. So this partnership uh, is a good, uh, a good way to permit Senegal to achieve uh, its goal in renewable energies. But uh, as you may know, uh, renewable energies has uh, sometimes uh, some, problem, some, some problems uh, as the intermittency. And uh, here in Senegal, we, ha we have also um, experiences with uh, mini grids, 
Uh, there is some localities where we, we installed mini grids and that uh, we, we did not do a good uh, follow up on these mini grids. So um, renewable energies here is a good way to achieve uh, universal uh, electricity access, but sometimes uh, the population are not really um, motivated when we talk about about uh, renewable energies because of their own uh, experience uh, that they have in their localities. Uh, so, uh, how, what, 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 what are the key challenges that we have in Senegal? Uh, in Senegal, uh, as I said earlier, we have um, ob an objective to to to, to increase the, the the electric the electricity access. Actually, we have about 70% uh, of national uh, electricity electrification rate. So the, the main objective here is to have univer universal access to energy for Senegalese people at the lowest price so that we can ensure equity and justice. Uh, so the, the key challenge is, is that we, we have to improve our technical capacities uh, so, so that we can handle the projects and ensure that we have the good follow up on the projects that we will uh, implement here in Senegal. Uh, the, the, the other challenge is to reduce the cost of energy. Achieve this uh, by uh, making um, better planning and, and use the financial capacities that we have in, in, in the best way possible here in, in, in Senegal. Uh, the, the, the other challenge is also to facilitate the project's implementation here in Senegal, because sometimes we can uh, identify some projects, but uh, we have so many, um, so many uh, problems that we, 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 we may solve that in, 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 uh, to, to facilitate the project's implementation here in Senegal. It, 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 it can be uh, technical, uh, technical issues, but also it can be social, organizational uh, issues, and um, sometimes, uh, um, how, how can I say, the, the acceptance of those projects uh, by the population can also be uh, sometimes a, a, a challenge. The other one is that uh, through the JET, we, 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 must, we must ensure that we create new jobs here in Senegal locally. We should not only uh, develop projects uh, that are coming from other uh, countries, uh, other societies that are outside the country. We must create new jobs and ensure that we have uh, local content for the project that we will develop. So uh, it, it, it comes from improving technical capacities, but also environmental, social, and economic capacities here in Senegal, so that we can take the best um, profit of this uh, of this partnership. Um, the approach that we that we choose here in Senegal uh, is that we have a, a steering committee. Uh, the, the the steering committee is the committee that. Um, that is composed of the main ministries that are uh, impacted by the energy transition. We have the Ministry of Energy, but we have also other ministries like, uh, like transport, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Environment, uh, and so far. So we decided to put on a steering committee uh, and we have high representatives of the of the government, but also in the steering committee, we included uh, population representatives as the civil society. We have uni unions that are represented in this uh, steering committee, and we also have representatives of the private uh, the private sector. Uh, this was decided because uh, we want to have uh, the voice of all the organizations, all the stakeholders uh, that, 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 uh, that are impacted by the JETP. 
so that they can help the government to decide uh, for the projects and what we will do uh, about this partnership. Uh, on the other side, we put in place uh, working groups. Uh, we have four uh, working groups. We have a working group on finance, one on policies, one on technologies, and the, the last group is about justice and, and equity. And also in this working group, we have the, the, the population representatives that are part of the working groups. Uh, so that they, they, they can bring the voice of the population on what they want, uh, what kind of projects uh, they think that will fit better in the localities where, where they are, uh, so that we, we will not make the same mistakes uh, um, that we did here in Senegal when we talk about uh, renewable energies. Uh, as you may know also, in Senegal, we discovered um, natural gas resources. So uh, today, the energy transition here in Senegal is based on natural gas. We want to, to, to switch uh, our thermal production from, uh, from fuel to, 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 to natural gas. And then with that, uh, combining to, to, to renewable energies, uh, Senegal uh, wish to, to reduce, uh, to reduce the, 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 the emission that we have in the country, uh, actually. Uh, so to, 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 to resume all that, uh, here in Senegal, the JetP partnership uh, has been, um, received as an opportunity to confirm our, our, our willing to, to, to install renewable energy projects. But uh, there is some analysis, some uh, experiences that we, 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 we wish to, 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 to take into account uh, in, the, in the beginning of the process so that we will achieve the, the target of 40% 40, 40 of renewable energy in our mix, but uh, we will achieve it, uh, ensuring that we, we, we put in, in place what we really need so that the population will not feel that they, 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 they haven't been heard about what they need and that we put in place things that will not, um, will not serve them. So the, 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 the main uh, challenge today is to, oh, so, sorry, the main I challenge. Think, mm -hmm. Okay, I think we need to wind, be winding up now. Oh, okay, thank you. So, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that. Sorry to, to cut you short, but um, we are running a little bit late and I actually have to go to a debate in the house at, uh, at uh, 11.30. Um, our budget debate as it is um so um so th this will be my my uh, but that but the the points about the the points that you're making and the specific example of how it's being received in senegal are really important and uh, ensuring that um that the voices of local people are reflected now that this this last question which i'm going to ask to both um firstly to be firstly answered by mugway and then by joseph by joseph and this is there's um five minutes for each to respond um 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 and um it goes to the, the heart of what of what sort of we can do uh here in amongst western governments and uh should should western governments adopt public procurement policies that will incentivize green and just sourcing throughout the supply chain um and i'm going to ask my to answer first and then and uh for and speak for, for five minutes um thank you chair uh in a nutshell yes it is important to implement and look into these types of policies i think we need to be very clear that it's not going to be a transition in my mind we're going to see transitions if we're going to do this in a healthy manner one of the key things we also need to be very careful of is not to implement policies that are going to penalize manufacturers, agricultural growers in the global south that supply 
a lot of these commodities into the global north. We must see how we can incentivize them. We must see how we can also put in the right structures that give them the time to transition. As I said, it will be transitions. And also the right structure to incentivize them to so that we don't have a green premium coming on top of their products and making them uncompetitive. So in a nutshell, Chair, I would say it is important, but a lot more thinking needs to go around this, a lot more engagement mm -hmm. to ensure that we are putting the right structures in place not to penalize, at the end of the day, the farmer that's in Malawi, the farmer that's in Kenya, the farmer that's in Ghana. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for your that, that, uh, that insight. And uh, yes, I, I have great you know concerns about the um, some of the um, unforeseen consequences, as you say, for uh, um, of um, of broadly drawn procurement um, um, rules. Uh, but I think they are an essential essential contribution that we can play. Um, now over to uh, Joseph. What, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank thank you very much. Um, that my answer is yes, that, that that should happen. We should see laws that um um that, that uh you know approach the culture and, and, and seek we, we can't hear you very well Joseph. Can you speak up? Hello? Hello? Ah. Is this any better? <laughs> yes that's better. Okay, good. So, sorry for that. Yes. We we um I would give three reasons why this should happen. The first is that we, as a continent, we are coming from a past where um, the interests of uh, communities and individuals, when it comes to business models, have not necessarily been, uh, the you know, given the the, the central position that they should um, that they should occupy. Yes, businesses are there for profit, but we are shifting from that old narrative. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can make profit and make sure that we are not doing this on the backs of communities and individuals. It's the old model uh, that has been there for the last 100 years. We It would be sad to see a transition if we are trying to make, if, if, if we are trying to make the world uh, green and 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 healthy and and um you know uh, reduce emissions. Then there's also the moral imperative to make sure that we take care of uh, of communities. The second reason is that if we've got resp uh, uh, laws that promote or put human rights at the center of the transition, it's actually in the enlightened self interest of um uh, of the global south uh, countries. Of, of the global north countries, of the corporations, because we are beginning to see a very unique uh, disruption. And I use disruption here in a very liberal way. Uh, we are beginning to see communities protesting. We are beginning to see communities going to court in our, our local jurisdictions and saying our rights have been violated. Not to the extent that one would hope for. There are cases where this takes more than even 10 years. But we are beginning to see that. Communities are talking to each other. Um, Jackson did mention a case, um, a, a good case of a company that is um, involved in uh, benefit sharing with the community. I am beginning to see communities uh, from other areas visiting that area and that company and saying, oh, we can do the same thing uh, for our, uh, our, our community where we are generating weed or, or geothermal or, or SORA. So it's in the enlightened self-interest of businesses to make sure that they um, and, 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 and you know, the governments that uh, support them to make sure that we've got laws that put human rights at, 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 at the center. Because we expect to see um, uh, more suspensions. We expect to see more uh, credible voices from the judiciary and other administrative actions. Uh, uh, we have seen disruptions that are very, very expensive in the, um, in the weed solar, uh, in the weed uh, sector, uh, and also in uh, a few mining areas in uh, some parts of Africa. And then the last point is, it is the right thing to do. If we can leverage our purchasing power, the same way when should leverage the purchasing power to go to the Berber or to the salon and say, I don't like the way you are treating your employees. Um, I, I I demand, you know, one and uh, these, these changes. Why not? How then can government and shouldn't government uh, come up with laws that um, really bring 
those companies that they uh, that they host and that they have uh, you know control over to make sure that they put human rights at the center. So there is the 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 the, the fixing of the historical issues. Um, there is a question of uh, a, a reputational, financial, and legal risks, and also there is a question of it's the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Joseph. And now I think we're going to go to uh, to Theo uh, for uh, Theo Clark uh, for uh, supplementary questions to to Glenn and Ye. And I think I'm afraid I am going to have to leave in in six minutes. So I'm going to ask uh, Lord Oates if he would ask ask my final uh, question and uh, and close uh, this part of the panel. Is that okay, Lord Johnny? Thank you. Okay, Theo. Um Thank you, Chief. I just wanted to pick up on this point about just energy transitions being connected to environmental and human rights. And um, Glenn and Yaya, could I ask, do you think um, that external private investment can be needed for just energy transitions? But how does that interact, firstly, with this point about the environmental and human rights that we've been listening to? And secondly, how does that also work by not reducing the policy and regulation space of African governments? Um, Glenn, do you want to answer that first? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm going to start with, you know, uh, what Joseph said, you know, uh, which is um, enlightened self-interest. Uh, and historically, you know, uh, business or private investment has not been associated with that. Uh, and we know that, uh, you know, finance and investment can be a force for good. Uh, and we've seen we've seen that you know in in how private capital and investment has been mobilizing around these questions. You know uh, the you know um, principle for responsible investments as an example, the mining uh, commission twenty thirty, uh, and and some of the challenges that we put to them really in, in response to your question is. Uh, you know, ensuring that you know, the just, equitable, and orderly just energy transition is fast tracked. Uh, and most of the panelists have spoken to this: putting nature, people, lives, and livelihoods at the heart of climate action. Uh, and for workers and trade unions, and this is urgent: addressing the lack of concrete labor impact assessments in the global south. Uh, and that's where, if this is unattended, more, you know, uh, 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 disruptions is, is is going to come from. And and lastly, maximizing the social value of external private investment for just transition, you know, uh, and and they must do this, you know, in dialogue, in conversations uh, with stakeholders, with governments, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and to your second question, I mean, it's not as if we are talking in a vacuum here uh, about not reducing the policy and regulation space of African governments. African governments are organized already around these questions. The African Union, for one, and the African mining vision, uh, I want to argue, must be given space and support for the articulation of Africa's own policy dictates around these questions in conversation, of course, with external global North countries uh, like the UK, the EU, the United States, et cetera. And lastly, the notion that just transition in the global South operate too much like aid programs. And we need a complete departure from that because that takes away decision-making power uh, uh, from the south and puts it in the global north. Uh, so, so, so that would be my 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 brief response. Thank you very much, uh, honourable MP. Um, thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to add anything on that particular question? Okay, fantastic. And in which case, uh, in fact, I know Chi, you've got to, to leave, so I'll just pick up on your, your final point. Um, are there any examples you know of where investors and in new energy projects have respected the rights of indigenous people 
Um, I think on the committee, we're interested to know, you know, what lessons can we learn from that? So if you've got any specific case studies, I'd be interested to, to hear. And perhaps, Jackson, we could ask you first. Would anyone like to pick up on that about um, specific examples? Yes, yes, if I if I oh. may. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Please, please, please go 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 ahead. Uh, yes, sure. Um, uh, honourable chair, I think uh, one. I'll speak about our experience um, advising Onsiswa Energy, which is a geothermal greenfield development company in Kenya. Um, it's been working in Trocada County, which is in northern Kenya, um, with the community uh, in Parakati Ward. Now, part of the first things that uh, we had to do was create a welfare committee within the community, also incorporate the county, because in Kenya we have a devolved system with counties, uh, and also set up a framework that investors would understand. Uh, that framework was the Performance Standard 7 of the World Bank that also speaks to particular SDGs of how we're going to, de how we're going to deliver them while keeping the integrity of indigenous people intact. We had to take steps forward in terms of developing an MOU with the community and the county that ensured that there was agency. Now, when we speak of MOUs, um, it speaks around a gentleman's agreement on what each party is going to do and what the co-benefits would be. From a practical standpoint, this took about four years to develop without having put a foot into the ground. Now, I think it's a bit different uh, given the capacity that the company and the, the leadership had to see this through, but it's, this is the reality of how long it takes if you wanna get things right. And getting things right in areas that have never been done before, it's trailblazing. And so the reality is also for investors is you've got to be willing to have staying power You've got to be willing to be malleable and flexible to understand what are the needs of the community? What does the future look like for the community? So that you can put together a working agreement that speaks to the spirit of what both are going to do and stick to it with absolute truth. And that process did teach us a lot about that particular community that are fantastic and have supported the project because they are your partners and we do see them as uh, strategic partners in the project to see it happen and to be our champions. Um, and so I would say, speaking for us, that's what we would see. But it's also safe to say, and it's important for people to note that bad actors are everywhere. Um, it's on the side of investors, it's on the side of government, but it's also on the side of communities. Um, you are going to find people who want to exploit a situation and therefore there will be moral hazard that comes in. And so we have to also be practical in seeing and seeing where the truth lies and what can be done and what cannot be done. Because at the end of the day, you're going to have bad, bad actors from all corners. And so seeing a flawless project is not going to be there, but you will have speckles of diamonds that you will be able to say, these projects did see through, there are benefits. It may not be right, but they're trying to get it right. And that for us is our motto. It's not about being right, it's about how to, it's not about being right, it's about getting it right. Thank you. And and, and Jackson, if I could just bring you back in for another Kenya example. Yeah, thank you for this other opportunity. Uh, I think one thing I wish to add is it is very much important for these communities to realize themselves in these particular energy projects. And coming from where I come from, sometimes we find ourselves at the periphery. We are not inside, we are not part and parcel of the process. We are just seeing things and being influenced. No decision-making participation which is so critical in any project. And uh, this can be actually one of the way of trying to reduce conflict and delays in projects. And uh, sometimes damages, because it's not only on the community side, it also goes to the company side. 
or the project side. Therefore, I think one critical thing that projects or this policy should look into is how can these indigenous communities or affected people can be given free opportunity to contribute in decision making, particularly for issues that are affecting them. I want to bring, for example, the Orcaria 4 project. When it started 2009, there was a framework for engaging with the community, but it was coerced. There's no that freedom of the community giving their view. Decisions are being made for them. Therefore, the only thing is that they are going to endorse them. Number two, putting the project policies to the language that the community and are conversant. Sometimes we use English. Most of these people are illiterate. They cannot conceptualize these particular issues. Therefore, I think policies should bring the concept to the level that these affected communities can understand and respond from a free informed point where no one is being coerced to. And I think UK can actually produce or give such input in terms of future projects that will be coming. Lastly, how are we going to decide on indigenous affected projects? Because the World Bank project was one of the projects which had that question. And it took us like six years to prove that we are indigenous. And through that, we lost a lot. That's why the community, until now, they have not yet even secured their land title to where they have been actually relocated to. That left the community more vulnerable again. They can be displaced any time. You know, these are critical things that we need to look into while defining the policy that will govern uh, future projects, uh, energy projects within indigenous territories. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Jackson. I'm conscious, conscious of time because we've got to move on to the, the next panel. So can I thank everybody um, on panel one for a really interesting and informative discussion. Uh, we're now going to turn to panel Very quick two. question. Is, that yeah. Is it possible? Yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Yeah. Can I ask you, ADN, um, if there's cross-party support in Senghor for the JetP? And if she thinks that the elections um, that are coming up this year is going to have any impact upon it. Um, I believe she may have just dropped off the call because I, I got a message that her internet connection wasn't great. So it, yeah, if you can hear no us, we do respond. No but uh, if not, I, I think she may have had in issues with her internet. But we'll uh, we'll follow up then if I I think they may have dropped off the call. <laughs> um, brilliant. Well, can I thank everyone for for panel one? Uh, I'm Thea Clark, the vice chair of the APPG for Africa, and I'm delighted to introduce our second panel. So, if I could ask everybody on panel two to please join us and turn their cameras on. Uh, our second panel will be exploring the debates around regulatory reform the focus on multilateral organisations such as the World Bank, the IMF and the WTO, looking at how they can align fully with just energy transitions. We're also going to hear how far trade and intellectual property rules at the World Trade Organisation and in other trade agreements can enable and constrain tech innovation and particularly look at the transfer of transition technology to the global south and to learn what more can be done to mitigate any risks. So I'm delighted to welcome our second panel. We have joining us Dr. Kande Yumkeller, who is the chair of the President's Commission on Climate Change from the Renewable Energy and Food Security in Sierra Leone. We also have Peter Lunenborg joining us from the Trade for Development Programme lead at the South Centre, and Mavis Owusu, Gayamfi, the Executive Vice President of the African Centre for Economic Transformation. Um, and I should say Mavis used to sit on a board for an organisation I previously chaired as an MP uh, before I was elected. So a wonderful to, to see you join us, Mavis. Um, my first question to, to kick us off is to Dr. Yam Keller, which is how important do you think is domestic technology innovation and specifically 
international technology transfers in helping countries in Africa to meet these targets for a just and green energy transition? And, and why do you think that is? Thank you very much. Le, uh, thank you for inviting me to this parliamentary session. Let me put my remarks in a broader context so you understand my perspective. First of all, I want to emphasize that for Africa, just an inclusive energy transition is not just about decarbonization. For Africa, it is about access to energy to enable industrialization, structural change, wealth creation and jobs, and of course, fighting poverty. That context is important because in the European context or the broader discussions of climate, everybody's pushing Africa towards decarbonization, even though our emissions are less than 3%. First context. Second context is what was said in the earlier panel. Africa receives less than 2% of all global renewable energy investments in spite of the, the, the uh, abundant renewable energy resources. The third context, is urgency and scale. If we're discussing uh, just energy transition, technology and innovation in the context of the urgency of actions needed to keep us at 1.5 or below 1.5 temperature increase, I would submit the following. Local innovation is important. Local R&D to develop our own indigenous technologies are important, but that will take time. That will take time. If there is urgency to ensure universal access to energy in Africa now, and there is urgency in, by 2030 to keep emissions below the trajectory of one point, uh, higher than 1.5 uh, degrees temperature rise, then we have to push for technology transfer through investments. Investments are key. Investments come with te technology. They come with business models that will ensure sustainability over time. So I would say in the long term, yes, we should encourage and support domestic innovation, domestic in, uh, technology development. But right now, the key here is enabling African countries to attract investments into their energy sectors to push for universal access to energy. We know already that technology prices are dropping rapidly. We know that battery storage has dec declined significantly over the last 10 years. So we know the technologies that are available right now to ensure universal access to energy in Africa. So I would submit that technology transfer had to, has to be tied to enabling that investment to come in, into Africa. So it begs the question then, what are the enabling policy uh, that we need to put in place, enabling regulations, and how would we de-risk those investments? While at the same time, simultaneously, supporting local institutions to drive local innovation. In fact, I'll submit, the innovation has to be in the business models, in the public policy, to attract these investments to come in at scale. Over to you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Uh, for the next question, if I could bring in uh, my colleague, Lynn Brown. Lynn, can you hear us? Lynn? Oh, possibly her internet's dropped off. Uh, I'll read out Lynn's question. So her question was on what is the impact of the World Trade Organization on related intellectual property rules, particularly looking at green technological innovation in and technology transfer to Africa? And specifically, what more do you think advanced economies and the WTO can do to support African technological innovation and technology. And if I could ask that question to Peter specifically. Uh, thank you, uh, your, your Honourable. Um, so we will solve the world in seven minutes. Uh, so <laughs> but um, basically, I mean, this is a very old question no? on, on what is the relationship between uh, between IP and, and, and technology transfer and or innovation. <laughs> uh, Basically, the question is relating to WTO, um, but of course, we also have free trade agreements and other IP treaties that go beyond WTO, because WTO basically gives us the minimum IP standards. Well, generally, uh, IP rights uh, 
have advantages and disadvantages uh, because by its nature, they are monopolies, right? Um, and we all know that they have advantages and they also have disadvantages. Now, one of the disadvantages uh, could be, uh, and is the high cost of licensing. Um, another issue is, is actually not what is the impact of rules, but what is the impact of the absence of rules? Uh, because, for example, in the area of biopiracy and traditional knowledge, in fact, the, you can argue there is actually an absence of rules. Um, if you look at you know, the abuse of IPRs, the whole issue of evergreening and all of that, I mean, uh, how to basically you know, game the system, um, actually, you can argue there is an absence of, 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 of that kind of rules. And, and this is also important in the area of, of uh, energy technologies. So for example, here is an article on the conversation uh, about uh, solar molecular, molecular fuels, uh, which is very important uh, you know, uh, energy technology. Um, it's not only about the high cost of licensing, but also the refusal to deal because uh, often IP owners might want to sit because it's a right to them. They have the right not to not to provide a license, right? So basically to sit on their licenses until somebody comes along that buys them out or that gives them a an, an higher higher price or basically or to or to develop uh, their own products based on 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 on, on the IP. So uh, this will this will inevitably. Uh, lead to a delay in technology transfer. But of course, in the area of green uh, technology, we actually want to have it a bit faster. Um, and then we have a whole range of IPR related abusive and anti competitive practices. So it's not only about, I don't want to deal, uh, a high cost of licensing, but it's also the licensing conditions uh, to use IPRs. Um, so what can be done? Um, generally, um, at the WTO, now the WTO nowadays is becoming a forum, uh, especially for IPR, uh, more a meta forum, right? Um, so, so I would say in the WTO in general, uh, all these issues of environmental issues have to be discussed multilaterally. If we also want to uh, address technology transfer. Um, right now, um, this is resisted by developing uh, by developed countries uh, because there was actually a draft language in the outcome document of Abu Dhabi, which actually mentioned only mentioned the word uh, technology transfer very you know in the in very little way. But even that that was rejected. So we actually ended up uh, in terms of global trade and environment cooperation at an MC12 minus outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is something you know that, that that is very concerning because there is no multilateral commitment to actually discuss trade and environment in a multilateral format. I mean, of course, we have some plurilateral uh, discussions uh, under the umbrella of TESD, but not at the multilateral format. We don't have a strong commitment. Secondly, I think uh, we should think about a WTO that it should focus on delivering trade-related SDGs, uh, and that includes 17.7, which is very clear, promote the development, transfer, disseminate, and, and the creation of ESDs, on favorable terms. Um, and in fact, I did a paper on LDCs, and in fact, if you look at the trade-related SDGs, which I here categorized, Actually, most of them uh, actually progress. Actually, we went down the road with with most of them, including on on SDG seventy point seven. Uh, so clearly, there's a role for the international community and the UK to to bring all of these SDGs at least uh, to here to the plus, not to the minus. Um, I think that is the first question, right? Or I'm already in the second question. Uh, no, that that that's helpful. Uh, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I'm, I'm just con conscious of time, so we're running a bit behind from the uh, earlier panel. So if I could turn to my next question to Mavis. And reflecting on the recent AU summit in Addis, how do you think that the summit outcomes will influence future regulation to support just energy transition for the continent of Africa? Thank you very much, Honourable Clark, and it's wonderful to see you again. Um, so there are four things that I'd like to reflect on from the outcome of the AU summit, which I think is going to have an impact on how um, just energy transition for the continent moves ahead. So the first one is building on Dr. Yumkele's point about the need for finance. We should expect to see African countries and institutions really leveraging Africa capital more wisely for climate and development spending. Um, and two things happened at the summit. The first one was the launch of the African Club, which is an alliance of um, many of the existing multilateral financial institutions on the continent. Um, and the alliance aims to help these institutions to work together as a unit to represent Africa's interests with international financial institutions, including ensuring that countries are fairly um, um, evaluated for their value um, and also to help negotiate appropriate debt deals that countries will be able to pay back over a sensible um, time frame rather than the current um, complex system that is in place. The second thing was a proposal from the president of Ghana which was um, submitted for, to the summit for consideration. And that proposal was that all African countries should invest a minimum of 30% of their sovereign reserves in African multilateral institutions. Now, currently much of the money is invested overseas in dollars, yielding very little or in some cases negative interest rates. So talking about how do we leverage our balance sheets to better finance our own institutions to help us realize this ambition. The second issue is around an increase in cross-border trade within the continent. I think there's recognition that despite the launch of the continental free trade area, trade has not, uh, between countries on the continent has not increased. So one of the things that came out very strongly, and we had a very strong call out from the president of Zambia, was countries should look to trade with each other. And in the space of um, green transition and energy transition, really thinking around how do we work together to build green value chains within the continent? How do we ensure that we are act the, the, the minerals that we are mining, we can provide value addition before it's exported as part of our green value chains? And how do we collaborate around issues like solar, wind, high, um, hydro, um, et cetera? So there is a real sense of, we to contribute to a just energy transition, there's a lot of work we need to do amongst and trade amongst ourselves to realize it. The third one is that you should expect some real innovative ideas around international taxation. So you saw that at COP28, Kenya took the lead with France in establishing a multi-country task force to look at different options um, to tax high pollution sectors such as the aviation and shipping um, industry. They are also now looking at financial transaction taxes and fossil fuel taxes. And the idea is that Kenya will bring these recommendations to COP30 in 2025. And finally, you will see a much stronger push from African leaders on a fairer, more inclusive regulation and global decisions that benefit Africa. I think at the um, summit and in um, a piece that they did in The Economist yesterday, the presidents of Kenya, Ghana and Zambia were very clear that they, as presidents, would no longer be signing on to any regulations or agreements that do not benefit the continent, and they'll be pushing their colleagues on the continent to do likewise. So I think taken together, um, these efforts will definitely help build a much stronger African-driven um, agenda around how we finance just energy transition and climate finance more broadly. I'll stop there at the end. Uh, thank you very much, Mavis. Uh, if I could turn to uh, Lynn Brown for the next question. Oh, Lynn, you're on mute. <laughs> 
Am I on mute still? Oh, no, we can hear you now. OK, good. Alongside efforts to expand concessional climate finance, what regulations, policies and conditionalities need to be implemented or changed? At a, a multinational organisation such as the World Bank, the IMF, the World Trade Organisation, so that they can align fully with just energy transitions? Well, uh, this is Kande. Uh, from, my, from my standpoint, some of the multilateral institutions are doing as much as they can with the limited resources and within the confines of their mandates. So the question really should be what more can be done to, to strengthen them to back the work that African countries have enunciated, for example, in the Africa Climate Summit. I think that we need more support now from the multilateral institutions to undertake our green assets uh, audits to really assess how much green assets we have. This is a new concept. It's not an area where they were working before. So that's not a change in regulation, but it, in fact, it is a support expansion of support in that area uh, to, to help African countries properly evaluate how much green assets they have. Number two, support to those countries to define the carbon trade regulations in their countries for greater transparency, but also, again, based on the discussions in the earlier panel, to ensure that rights are protected. And indeed, it is a relevant question, who owns the credit? Is it the communities from whom, where the assets are based, or it's a national asset? So again, then you talk about revenue sharing and benefit sharing. So I believe that the multilateral agencies, the World Bank, African Development Bank, and others should really ramp up action now to support our countries to be able to do these green assets audits and the necessary regulations for uh, more transparent carbon trading and climate finance possibilities. Number two, we need to increase support for project development. I, I have been around COP now since COP 14, my time in the UN and now itself in my current role with government. My president is working on a just energy transition plan. When we finish that plan, we are as inclusive as we can be, all donors are, in, we're trying to rally all donors to get involved. You, then you get to the question, how do you finance this plan? This plan is for 10, 20 years to ensure that we have a just and inclusive transition. So one of the areas where I believe the multilateral groups like the World Bank and WTO and others should help us is also how we engage our mining companies in this process. They become an important uh, entity for anchor demand to attract bigger investments into green energy integration into our, our, our national energy grids. Um, they have the muscle, they have the, the financial instruments to encourage these companies because remember, most of us are resource-based. The extractive sector is an important element of this. So how can these multilateral institutions support governments to get companies, the big mining companies, to uh, uh, demand more renewable energy integration into the grid, but also how do they green their operations? Greening their operations means that there's a possibility for some integration into agricultural production systems, into access to clean water and irrigation schemes and so on in those catchment areas where they operate. The other area that I'll, I'll mention here, um, carbon finance, we have a lot of entities coming to our countries now. They claim they're trying to help us in accessing carbon finance. But it is not very transparent. We don't know who is doing what. Uh, we don't know how they're valuing our green assets. Are they selling the carbon at $2 when carbon in Europe is 100 euros per ton? So that issue of transparency and fairness in evaluating, in valuing the carbon trade is important. And our countries are trying to grapple with this. And for good reason, there is an estimate that about $120 billion of climate finance is possible in Africa in the next decade or more. How much of that can we access? How will the valuation be done? Will there be fair and transparent declaration of those revenues so our treasuries have the resources to, to build climate resilience? And in fact, th some of those resources can be deployed in the communities where those assets exist. So if there's a need for 
uh, reorienting the multilateral institutions, I will say these are immediate imperatives. But finally, energy access is key. We cannot do anything without affordable, reliable, sustainable energy solutions to grow our economies, to push green industrialization, and in fact, ensure stability. If there are jobs, there will be stability in Africa. If the youth don't have jobs, there will be crisis. So the UK government, I will say to you, even for you, there's, there needs to be a change in orientation. You have to support us to create wealth. I hear a lot about just poverty reduction. Poverty reduction means you're looking at small projects. Wealth creation and competitiveness means you will look at bigger infrastructure projects, bigger energy projects beyond meaning grids, bigger bulk energy pro uh, projects to drive industrialization as the African Union has called for in Agenda 2063. Over to you. Can I ask a very quick couple of follow-ups on that? Is that possible? Um, can I ask whether or not you prefer, you think it will be preferable for finance from multilateral banks or bilateral? Um, is, um, is, is it equally accessible? Is it e equally easy to access? And on the issue of opaqueness, do you think international standards are necessary? Um, it is not easy to access those finances that are made available either bilaterally or multilaterally simply because we're not able to develop the projects. Nobody wants to uh, finance the project development process. Private companies do. When they want to come into our country, they have the muscle to invest in, in the uh, uh, project development uh, 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 process. If you're looking at bigger energy, green energy projects, 200 megawatts, 400 megawatts, and you want African private sector to participate, someone has to support them for those project preparatory steps. The environmental impact assessments are expensive. Show me the African private sector that has the resources to put on the table $5 million immediately in my country. I'm not talking about the big giants, Nigeria or Kenya or South Africa. So if we want our private sector in, there has to be something else done to support our countries to develop the projects that will become bankable and then go to the multilateral or bilateral uh, DFIs. That does not exist. Uh, second, you, uh, um, well, you, that second question is, is, a little, is a little tricky here. I would say that we need some pragmatism. Yeah, we need some pragmatism to ensure that opaqueness, um, opaqueness from those who want to do carbon trade with us, that we support our countries. In my country, for example, what we, our president wants to do is strengthen our Ministry of Finance to, to have the carbon exchange hosted there initially until we can spin off. But we don't have the technical capacity. Uh, we don't have any carbon finance expert in my country. Uh, we have people coming to different ministries. They're already going to communities in the villages and acquiring lands and forests. Uh, well, we are not tracking that properly, but part of my job is to exactly do that, to be able to convene those discussions and help establish the frameworks, the regulations, and strengthen the Ministry of Finance to be our initial focal point with the right technical expertise to ensure opaqueness whether in carbon trading or in fact in, in, in meeting the commitments we've made in, in the different international forums on, on, on greening our economy. Over to you. Thank you very much. Do I come in now to the same question? Um, uh, yes, that, that would be great, Mavis. Thank you. Fantastic. So I spoke earlier on about what African governments are doing. I, I just want to focus on a few things in relation to the IMF and the World Bank. Um, if we are going to see the progress, we need to uh, really make a shift from the analysis and to some real actions. So for the first one, with the IMF, we really encourage faster and larger restructuring of the unsustainable private debt um, that countries are facing through IMF programs. Um, and a major part of it is the IMF's own debt sustainability analysis tool, which everybody agrees is not working, needs to be overhauled, yet we are still discussing how best to do it. The second thing that the 
um, fund needs to do with its members is to really look at modification around special drawing rights. We've been talking about reallocation for special drawing rights now for two years, and we are still discussing it. The African Development Bank has come up with a really excellent way in which they can leverage those um, special drawing rights five times for African countries. And it's the, the re-channel of these S existing SDRs are still being discussed. The third thing for the fund is to really streamline the prerequisites for the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, which would make it really, you know, it would, it's a crucial step towards amplifying access to climate financing. Right now, it is difficult for that to happen. And a streamlining of those prerequisites would really help countries to make that alignment between climate finance and development finance. The, 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 the fourth thing for the fund is the fund is really pressing for carbon pricing as a core form of climate policy and the main revenue source for resource mobilization to boost energy transition. However, carbon pricing is not a one size fits all. And when you look across the um, African continent, our journey um, towards greening our economies differs widely from north, south, east, west, center. So the IMF really needs to consider individual countries as all sub regional approaches. Um, towards green, you know, their um, efforts to encourage developing countries to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, and finally, the IMF really needs to work with the other multilateral institutions to intensify efforts to promote cooperation around climate finance, especially for mit mitigation and adaptation. I mean, I think there's been so much research around the annual gap. We know the amount that we don't seem to be making much progress towards it. For the World Bank, just four very quick points, if I may. We really need multilateral bankers like the World Bank to adopt zero cost net present value um, natural disaster clauses when they are lending to countries. Um, this will enhance shock absorption should these countries have uh, faced um, a natural disaster. We also really need the bank to do more around, um, you know, um, things like accelerating de-risking of project financing and extending concessional capital um, to um, African countries. So I believe um, Dr. Yumkela was saying earlier on around the risks um, perceived around these investments. The bank has instruments like guarantees that they can use to de-risk this um, these investment, and we would like to see them use more. Um, of those tools. Um, and finally, it would be great to see, um, you know, the multilateral institutions really think through below market rate or concessional capital for climate financing when they are looking at emerging and developing economies. So there are tangible recommendations. Um, and our ask to the UK government is, how, as a you know, a key shareholder of these organisations, do we shift the recommendations from these numerous research papers into real action? Uh, thank you, Mavis. Uh, and that's it. For my last question from me is for Peter. What is the impact of trade-related environmental tariffs, such as the EU Carbon Adjustment Border Mechanism? and non-tariff barriers on green innovation and development in Africa. And can I ask specifically, Peter, what, what do you think are the barriers to mitigating any risks? Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, so, so what I will do, I will focus on CBAM. I mean, CBAM, I mean, from the African or developing country perspective, is basically increasing the cost of exports and affecting the bottom line. Of course, a good thing may be that, you know, it forces us to produce greener, uh, but that, you know, money can only be used once in a certain period of time. So that, that might also mean that might to be to the detriment of, of other issues like, you know, other R&D in, 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 or expansion of production. So it's also an issue of, of timing there. Of course, the logic of CBAM is understandable when you have a domestic emissions trading system that is that is binding. 
However, CBAM should not be more discriminatory than the ETS is for domestic producers, and it should be aligned and consistent with international trade rules, whether the WTO or free trade agreements. So some issues that, you know, if we really talk about, you know, green innovation in particular, um, uh, an investment is that the working, there is working capital tied in, in CBAM certificates that are required to be held into an account. Uh, if you look at the EU CBAM, for example, that amount seems to be more than the taxes, you know, than the monetary equivalent that should be required, that, uh, you know, so in fact, there is an unnecessary amount that is being, that cannot be used for any investment. Uh, there is no secondary financial market or there, will, there won't be a secondary financial market for CBAM certificates, but for allowances in the ETS, you have that. So once something is tradable, you can you can build all kinds of instruments around it, but you, you cannot with CBAM certificates that will just disappear after, after an ex expiry period. Um, the implementation of the verification provision, so uh, under CBAM, creates a knowledge base in CBAM countries. So under the EU, it is EU-based uh, professionals who will go around all the factories in the world, will fly around, visit all the factories, and they will have the knowledge of how processes in factories are working, you know, and where in what factory, oh, in that factory in India, they do it like that. So maybe in Vietnam, we can do it like that. So, so it will create a knowledge base in the EU. Um, CBAM does not offer additional access to technology, knowledge, technology finance for reducing CO2 emission intensity. Uh, and in fact, if you look, look about uh, redistribution, uh, it seems like the taxes collected from African exports and developing country exports would be used for domestic purposes. This is still on the discussion in the EU because in the EU they they deleted the, the redistribution part in the final CBAM. But but uh, it, it it seems like that the tech, that basically Indonesian steel exports will pay for the greening. For, so for subsidies for greening EU industries. That is basically what it comes down to. Uh, so I wrote a paper on uh, not this, this background reading, uh, you know, uh, identifying how CBAM could be improved to in order to align with the retail rules. Uh, it is possible, uh, but it has, it has to be tweaked a little bit. Uh, so mitigating risk, I mean, how I interpreted it is that all these uh, trade-related uh, measures, uh, including CBAM, have the potential to be very explosive uh, and, and to create trade wars, actually. Um, so, so I think we really need to, that's why I focus on multilateral cooperation. We need multilateral cooperation. Uh, and one of that in the WTO, uh, maybe the UK can support development of guidelines for CBAMs, for example, uh, or more broadly for the development and implementation of trade-related environmental measures. Uh, proposals have been made. So on trade-related environmental measures, the African group made proposals, Colombia made proposals. Uh, on, 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 on you know, CBAM, uh, there is a good report from the European Climate Foundation on the future of trade in a net zero world. Uh, and in fact, they made similar recommendations vis-a-vis -vis the CBAM. Uh, then with respect to the UK CBAM in particular, because this is something that you, I think, will have a lot of influence in because it's currently under development. Mm -hmm. uh, it is basically to ensure that non-discrimination vis-a-vis the UK ETS, which is also under development, uh, under update, uh, is, is, is being safeguarded. Compliance with other relevant WTO disciplines. I was talking about the working capital that's tied into, into the certificates. Uh, that's actually a provision in the trade certification agreement on guarantees, Article 7.33. And import licensing, because some of these things are actually relating to import licensing. Comments procedures will become very important. Uh, if you look at the EU palm oil, you know, the re EU renewable energy regulation, where they look at the low risk, high risk palm oil uh, and stuff like that. Actually, they, they said it is actually a TBT measure. Uh, and then the comments procedures, uh, as per the TBT agreement, apply. Uh, and probably the same applies also to CBAM. So, Comment procedures and, and, and discussion prior to the enact is, is very important. Uh, then, you know, open up verification of CO2 measures to African and African-based experts, which would create a cadre of, of professionals. 
this is to and this would also increase lower the cost of our application uh, because if, you know it doesn't make sense to fly around all over the world to visit factories. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it it might make sense to open up the verification to and you know to increase the pool of verifiers. Uh, then of course transition periods as in the technical system capacity building are particular for MSMEs. I mean what all these rules do is they will be very particular. I mean they they will be very uh, onerous, particularly for smaller companies, uh, because it's a fixed cost. Whereas maybe for bigger companies, I mean, they're already international companies, they might be a local subsidiary of an international company, but uh, I think MSMEs uh, have to be uh, looked at. Uh, and then of course, uh, use of resources in the CBAM for renewable energy investment in Africa. So he would talk about uh, how to redistribute resources. So, so, so these are some issues to, I mean, to, to mitigate risk. So thank you, that, Peter. That That's really useful. helpful. Thank you so much. And, yeah. and, and you're very welcome to for any panelists to submit any um, presentations to us by email afterwards. So we have a copy of your slides. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave you because I've got to catch my train back to my constituency meeting. So I'm going to hand back to Lord Oates to chair the short Q&A. But uh, can I say thank you to all the panelists today for giving us this time and, and energy and sharing your experience. Um, I, I do think as a parliamentarian who's a member of the APBG, it's really important that our British policy work is being influenced and informed by African stakeholders. So I think having you all on the panel today has been uh, really helpful and, and very useful for our work. So I'll hand back to uh, Lord Oates to, to chair the final questions and to close the meeting. But thank you all very much for, for joining us today. Thank you, Theo, and thank you for um, so excellently chairing this this session. Um, and uh, apologies uh, that I wasn't uh, able to be present at the beginning, as unfortunately I had a question in Parliament. Um, it, we uh, now have a short period of time uh, for questions. Um, we have some questions which have been placed in the uh, the Q and A um, box. If anybody um, has any further questions, please um uh, uh uh add them um but let me um uh, ask uh one of these questions um uh, and this is from uh, michael b in addition to uh indigenous industries uh being protected in multilateral agreements how can leveraging of the um uh, of the energy industry in africa and the increase um, uh, support for energy technology transfer to the developing South also ensure energy access in rural um, areas. Um, I believe Karina Lee may want to come in on this. Um, I'm being messaged. Is Karina Lee available to come in to answer this question? No. Um, okay. Well, then I'll turn it over to the panel. Is, um, is, is there any of the panelists who would like to tackle this um, question? I'm happy to give it a... Go ahead, Dr. Yunkella, please. Since you are sitting in government, well, you have best place to do it. <laughs> well, the, the reality for most sub-Saharan African countries is that we have to follow two tracks at the same time. We have to attract investment in bulk power production, big energy projects, renewable energy projects that can be integrated into the grid. We need that for industrialization to push towards that five, six, seven percent growth rate, given the demographic pressures we have. We have pressures to create jobs. Those jobs will come if we begin to add value and go into green manufacturing in Africa. Therefore, you need bulk power. At the same time, we must pursue decentralized energy solutions, mini grids in community, communities that are integrated into agricultural production systems. So we have to follow both tracks. Both require financing, both require policy incentives, and both require de-risking instruments. So for the UK government, um, I would encourage strongly that the UK government look, uh, considers how will they incentivize big UK companies to join us on this journey? So, for example, my president has set a clear target. He wants to do 500 megawatts to basically triple the capacity we have in the country. A whole country with just 250 
megawatts power supply for 8 million people. That's untenable with the level of uh, population rise. We have the right programs. We have feasibility studies. We need UK companies to discuss with us how they can enter this space with more solar energy, solar hydro uh, hybrid solutions. At the same time, we need UK capital impact investors backed by the UK government to go into distributive power. Again, my president has set a target. We want to do 200 more mini grids. To this, I want to give the UK government credit. It was the UK government seven years ago that did the first set of mini grids in Sierra Leone. And today we have 100. So 100 communities are benefiting because of FCDO leadership. The issue now is, can we scale this up? We need 200 more. So we have to follow that, which means, and here this is where your aid money really will speak volumes. How can you back indigenous private sector people to learn from the experience we had in the first generation of mini grids to go now into the rural areas and install 50 kilowatts, 200 kilowatts embedded in food systems to produce more food, to uh, do irrigation schemes using renewable energy. So the answer to the question is we need to follow both tracks. It is not either or. I, I emphasize that because you have European NGOs in many cases trying to convince our countries that, oh, the only hope for you is the small distributed energy projects. Yeah, I have seen, yeah, I interact with them, uh, Honorable MP. I interact with them a lot over the last 25 years and we fight over it. We need both. We are so far behind that we need both for in social inclusion, to power our hospitals, to power our production systems, to have access to clean water, but at the same time to create wealth. We need to create wealth and jobs so fast, otherwise we'll export more immigrants to you. We hope they can come as legal paying tourists, not jumping on boats to go through uh, 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 the desert, if you see what I mean. So it's in the last session we were talking about enlightened self-interest. It is in UK's enlightened self-interest to say, yes, we have to drive both and we drive both solutions very aggressively going forward. And aid money can help, public finance can help de-risk both investments. Over to you. Thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive answer. That's uh, very informative. I, I think we'll now move on to the next question. Um, and this is a question really about divestment uh, and it's specifically referring to Nigeria um, uh, where, according to the question, international oil majors, including Shell, uh, are divesting, um, arguably a consequence of the global transition and leaving producing areas worse off as a result. I mean, I guess this is part of the, the core of just transition. Um, are there any members uh, of the panel um, who would like to, to comment on that and what um, uh, sort of approaches the UK needs to take to ensure that... Um, as we move to a greener energy sources, it doesn't leave uh, behind uh, communities and economies. Uh, Mavis, is that something you want to come in or any other panel members? Sure, Lodo. I think that the challenge is around diversification of economies. So um, countries that have been heavily dependent on oil production struggle when companies close down. I mean, communities are heavily impacted and we don't see it just in Nigeria, we see it all around the world. So the question is, how are we helping countries to diversify their economies from a dependence on, um, you know, um, mining minerals? And the question, that's the issue for Nigeria. What else can Nigeria do? What are the value chains Nigeria can develop? Nigeria, with its population size, has huge potential to build a lot of the industries that actually produce production centers for the rest of the continent. So we're talking about green value chains. We need machinery. Nigeria could actually produce that machinery for the rest of the continent, given its population size. So that would be my um, recommendation for the UK government, both in its own development work, but also in its in um, its engagement as a key investor in multilateral institutions to really be pushing for supporting countries to diversify their economies so that the negative impact um, of the transition is minimized over time. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and then I think we've got time for one um, more question. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Nadia Saracini, um, which is, do the panelists see potential benefits of a proposed legally binding instrument treaty on business and human rights currently being negotiated? If so, wh what kind of provisions would they like to see incorporated, not just to ensure respect for people's rights, but also to ensure a just transition that grows prosperity uh, and enables rights to be fulfilled. Um, uh, I don't know if somebody from the previous panel um, would want to come in on, on this question. Are there any members of the previous panel that touched on some of these? No, I'm not sure whether they're all still with us. Um, is there anybody on this panel who would like to touch on this? To Yom Kala or or Peter Lundberg. Sorry, repeat repeat the question again quickly. Just a uh, summary. Of it. Say, do, do you see potential benefits of a proposed legally binding instrument on business and human rights? And if so, you know what are some of the key provisions that you think would be needed? In it? Well, um, I think the last panel covered it well. Um, since we're all pushing now for greater uh, climate finance on the Article 6 for developing countries, it is imperative that um, we help these smaller countries develop their Climate Act within which they can embed the rights issues that were being discussed earlier, uh, Honorable Oates, in your last last uh, uh, session. In fact, I made many notes because I am I'm already the Human Rights Commission here and the lawyers have chased me last week and I have promised them to have a session. So I took down some of the names of your panelists to say, thank God you're helping me now. I'll do the same session with them. And I believe they're right. It is imperative because these assets happen to be in the communities. And I see many now, I mean, uh, uh, we, they're telling us about our mangroves that we should keep them. And I see companies already trading uh, 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 those with those mangroves, but I'm not sure. These are some of the poorest areas in, in our country. I'm not sure how much the communities know about the actual valuation. I don't know how much the revenues are. There's one pro two proposals in front of me here. So I give you a practical example. One claims by their own intervention in clean cooking solutions, they can trade up to $75 million a year yeah, of, of, of emissions. Now, the question is how much of that will come back but more importantly, how much of that can be ring fenced to ensure that we give communities and women and children clean cooking, uh, access to clean cooking fuels and technologies so they don't cut down the trees and they don't get sick. Another proposal says to me, with what they want to do with carbon capture and storage and carbon sequestration, they can generate a revenue stream of $200 million a year. And immediately I said to myself, oh, I wonder how much of that will go to my village to ensure that we have alternative livelihoods so our people don't starve. Will all of it go into the central consolidated revenue fund? And you know, with all our countries, including yours, it goes to treasury. Somebody else has discussion over that. But I want the communities to have the rights from the day we design the projects, from the day the private sector comes in. So getting some broader international standards and guidance on that will be very useful. And I think in your last panel, uh, Honorable Oates, somebody mentioned that even with the UK, maybe we should be looking at some bilateral uh, agreement with you where we can specify, for example, the benefit you give us in Africa based on the climate conference in Nairobi, can you begin to establish a, a, a floor on how much our, our green assets, uh, carbon uh, sequestration projects, how much they can value those carbon for? It's not $4. Can we have a bilateral with you where UK says any company doing carbon trading in Sierra Leone, the, the valuation cannot be below $10, $20, uh, $20 a ton, for example, it's a, a floor. And then we can see how we negotiate up, upwards based on the economics of the project. But we are here in $2, $4, $3, I mean, or $7. That seems to me like climate injustice. Carbon is carbon. It should be priced the same. Over to you, sir. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. That's such a helpful and useful uh, response. So thank you for that. Um, I'm afraid, and my apologies to people who put questions that haven't been asked, and my apologies we couldn't put every question to every member of the panel, but I'm afraid we are um, out of time now. Um, it's my job, uh, really, to thank all our panellists. Um, it's really been, uh, for me, a great privilege to chair this inquiry. And particularly so because we have had um, such uh, excellent uh, witnesses who really massively kind of added to our understanding. Uh, so I want to say a huge thank you to to all of you on this panel uh, just now. I'm sorry I wasn't here at the beginning because um, what I've heard since I have been here has been so informative. Um, but I will catch up uh, on video. Thank you to our um, previous panel uh, as well. Again, extremely um, in, uh, informative. Um, as you know, the purpose of this inquiry is to uh, help ensure that um, us in the UK, parliamentarians and policymakers, um, when thinking about these issues, are properly informed by perspectives from uh, the African continent. Um, and um, to have your sort of expertise and perspectives has been uh, hugely uh, invaluable. Um, I want to thank also um, uh, our parliamentarians, uh, Chi Onwara, uh, the chair of our um, uh, all-party parliamentary group, uh, Theo Clark and, and Lynn Brown. I think I can speak on behalf of all of them uh, when I say that um, this has been a really useful session to us. Um, finally, um, I want to thank our inquiry partners, including our special advisory group, some of whom have been listening in uh, today, uh, and uh, also um, Frexim Bank, uh, Africa No Filter, Oxfam, the Africa Climate Finance uh, Foundation, um, ACET, Surge Africa, CAMCO, and the Climate Action Platform uh, Africa. Uh, to find out more, please follow us on uh, X or Twitter, as it was formerly known, at, uh, at Africa, A-P-P-P-G. Um, and then, um, as you may be aware, we um, have a potential election at some point uh, this year. Um, uh, so we, um, we're not sure about the timing, but um, uh, assuming it doesn't come uh, before the summer, um, we're planning to launch um, the, the report uh, in person on the evening of Wednesday, the 24th of July, on the House of Lords Terrace, I'm informed. Um, uh, so please uh, follow us on X to keep on, on uh, up to date on inquiry developments. And also, um, I'm, I'm also asked to make a plug, consider joining the Royal African Society uh, as well for, for updates. Uh, so thank you uh, to, to everybody. Um, uh, uh, we've really uh, enjoyed and been informed uh, by you. Uh, so thank you. And I now close uh, this session of the inquiry. Thank you.